Thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited to have a message I think is going to really help, especially in our time right now. But before we do get into it, if you would please join me in some prayer. Um, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this message. I pray that Holy Spirit, you would please speak through me and that um, my lips would be your lips and my mouth would be your mouth. And I just pray that um, you would please help us to learn from your word and grow in your word and apply your word to our lives and just grow in you through this. As I see in Jesus' name, amen. So in consideration for what message we, I should do today, I was going over different topics and I came, keep coming back to boldness. And I think boldness is so important in our culture today as we're a society lacking in boldness and specifically the church is greatly lacking in boldness. Um, the church has really become quite weak and Christians have for a long time now been lacking boldness. And I think boldness is such an important issue. I'm so excited to get into it today. And I feel like there's no better passage to go over boldness than Joshua 1, 6 to 9. So if you will join me there, Joshua 6 says, Be strong, God here is talking to Joshua. He says, Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The land being, you know, the Holy Land, Israel and Palestine and all those areas. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from him to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law, and the book of the law for us is the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you have good success. And this is where the very famous verse one nine comes in. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, this is one of the most famous promises in the Bible. Most people who have been Christians for a while, even people who are non-Christians are familiar with this verse because it is so popular, Joshua 1.9. But I was thinking, you know, we really have to get into the context of it before we get into the actual promise. And here the promise is that he'd be with you wherever you go. But before he gives him that promise, he tells him that he must be in the word or what he calls the law of Moses. He says, don't depart from it to the right or to the left, meditate in it day or night. So before he gives him the promise that he'll be with him wherever you go, wherever he goes, he tells him you must meditate in the word day and night. So in order to even have any sense of boldness, you have to meditate in the word. Joshua went on to conquer all these great lands, one of Israel's greatest war leaders. And he, had, he did this because of his boldness, because of the promise of God that he'd be with him wherever he goes. If you know God's going to be with you wherever you go, you'll have no problem being bold. But in order to have this boldness, you first have to get into the word. And I think that's so important that we observe that, that we make sure we obey God's word, that we don't depart from it or turn from it to the right or to the left in order to have God's promise of boldness upon our life. We can look at some other passages that I think are very important to understand what boldness is. And I think there's so many great examples of boldness throughout the Bible, like we just read in Joshua. But one great example is, in the, is Daniel himself, but also Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego showed great boldness. So if you will turn with me to Daniel 3, 14 to 18, which says... Daniel 3, 14 to 18 says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? So a little bit of uh, pre-knowledge here. Nebuchadnezzar was setting up a great golden image to be worshipped throughout all his territories, which the Babylon Empire had conquered. Obviously, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being Jews, had a great problem with this, especially being faithful Jews. So here they are, and Nebuchadnezzar finds out that they had been disrespecting him and not worshiping the God he had set up. So he says, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? 
Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar makes a very prideful statement. He says, your God will not be able to deliver you from my hands. I'm, I'm king. I'm over all the nations. But I love uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego's answer to him. I think it's such a bold answer. And I think it's a great example of boldness. And they say, oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answer and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold images which you have set up. I love their answer. At first, in verse 17, they say, our God whom we serve, I love that they say, is able to deliver us. They don't know if he's going to deliver them, but they know that he's able to deliver them from the burning, fiery furnace. And they do believe that he is going to be, deliver them because they say, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. So they, say, they know that he's able and they believe that he's will, but they aren't 100% sure, of course. But I love even more so their answer in verse 18, which says, but if not, if, they, if he doesn't deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And that's the really bold part of that answer. Here, they're looking down probably the most powerful man in the world and being threatened with burning in an extremely fiery furnace. And they answer him, not only are we not going to serve your gods, not only are we not going to worship the image that you have set up, and not only are we going to take the chance that we get burned in the furnace, but let it be known to you that we did not worship your God or the gold images which you have set up. So they're telling him, let it be known to you. Such a bold answer. They're talking directly back to the king. Such a bold, bold, powerful answer. I love it. I absolutely love it. And um, another example of boldness is once again in Daniel. This is Daniel himself. In um, for Daniel 6, 10 to 13. We read, now when Daniel knew that there, so a little pre-context again, this by now, Nebuchadnezzar had been defeated. He had died long ago. Uh, the kingdom of Babylon, which was currently un under the reign of Belshazzar, had been taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire and was now, uh, Darius was in charge where Daniel lived and Daniel now served King Darius of the Medo-Persian Empire. And um, Daniel was very favored with Darius. He grew to great liking and great power in the kingdom of uh, the Medo-Persians. And the counselors and the pagans and the heathens all got very upset about this. And they said, well, let's, let's conspire against this Daniel who's so favored with the king. And so they say, we know Daniel loves to pray. So let's make a decree that if he, if he prays, he will be thrown to the lion's den because they can only worship the king very deceptive, very manipulative thing to do. And uh, Daniel's aware of this. And we pick up in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that when the writing was signed, he went home in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was custom since early days. I love that not only did he continue to pray, but he didn't pray in secret, which would have been bold by itself, just thinking, well, you know, even if they do catch me in secret, I'm still going to get eaten alive by lions. But he opened his windows. He basically said, I don't care if you catch me. I want you to see me praying. I'm going to pray to God no matter what. And I think that's such an awesome sign of boldness. And it's something we need so much in our culture nowadays. We need to say, I don't care what you have to say about me. I don't care what you have to think about me. I'm going to obey my God. I'm going to stand up against the culture. I'm not going to bend. And I'm going to stand, kneel, and obey my God. I think it's so awesome that he does that. Let's continue reading. Then these men, picking up in verse 11, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? 
The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And when the king found this out, he, the king was very distressed as he greatly loved Daniel, and he did have to go through with the only edict that he signed, and Daniel did get thrown into the lion's den, just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego got thrown into the fiery furnace. They were punished for their boldness, and both times they knew that the punishment could mean death, and quite brutal death at that, but they trusted in God to deliver them, and in both situations he did, but more than that, they were bold, and they were obedient. I think obedience is essentially in every aspect of the Christian life. I think to be, it's obedient to be bold to God. And they show this great boldness, which is great obedience to God. And they do get delivered. And not every time do those who show great boldness to Christ get delivered. Um, a personal favorite of mine, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was incredibly bold. He managed to escape to New York and, and during Nazi Germany. And he went back because he felt that it wasn't right that others suffer while he was living safely. And he, would, he became a martyr, but he died living boldly. He his reward is in heaven. His reward isn't life here on earth. So if you're a true Christian, you don't really care about death. Like Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You want to be bold and be obedient to God in that manner. And um, really, our ultimate example of boldness is Jesus. And Jesus was so bold throughout the Gospels. Uh, I love the book of John. It shows Jesus' interactions with people so well. And in John 8, 44, part A, we read, you are, Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees after they're challenging him constantly on his um, sayings and his parables and his doctrines, constantly trying to trap him, and he never does. But he answers them uh, very angrily and very boldly and says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus there gets into the devil and his character. We learn a lot about the devil there in that little passage right there. But I took this scripture because it shows Jesus' boldness. Here are the Pharisees, by far the most powerful religious authorities in Israel, and arguably some of the most powerful people in Israel, period. They have, they, Jesus knows that they plot to kill him, and eventually they do, and Jesus wouldn't be delivered from the cross. He would die on the cross for us and would die again three days later for us, knowing that he had to do that. But Jesus here is standing up to the Pharisees, the most powerful religious people in Israel, and calls them of, calls them of the devil. He literally gives them the greatest insult you could ever give a person. He, tell, he tells them that their father is literally Satan. It's such an act of incredible boldness. And another act of boldness we can see is Jesus on trial before he's crucified and He's getting asked all these questions, and they ask, they ask him how Jesus goes into how his, his authority and his power, and he goes into seeing Abraham and seeing Abraham's rejoicing, and they, they ask him, that, then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? They're saying, well, how can you have seen Abraham? You're, you're not even 50 yet. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Once again, here Jesus is on trial. Most people on trial are trying to escape death and trying to kiss up to whoever is persecuting them in order to escape punishment. But Jesus here stands bold. And not only does he tell them to back off, but he also tells them that I am. It's the same bold statement that God made to Moses in Exodus 3.14. He says, I am who I am. It's such a bold, bold statement. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.12 says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Here he's talking about being an evangelist. He's talking about witnessing. He's talking about our, the way Christians ought to talk. And he says, because we have such a great hope in Jesus, and you can't really have hope in Jesus unless you've accepted him, and it's hard to have hope in him unless you read his word, like going back to our original passage in Joshua 6.9, we can't depart from his word in order to have boldness, in order to have that promise that I will never depart from you. But because we do have that hope in Jesus, we use great boldness of speech. 
when we're going around, we ought to use great boldness of speech. There's this trend going around nowadays in the church that somehow Christians are supposed to bend a knee to whatever happens and not say anything and stand up. That's the absolute lie. And especially from pulpits, pastors should be bolder than ever nowadays with all the uh, insanity going on in our world. It's a ridiculous, uh, preposterous notion. And then in Ephesians 6, 19 to 20, once again, Paul, and I love this passage. He says, and for me, that utterance may, to, may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Because isn't the gospel so, take so much boldness to proclaim? It does, it really does. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We, we learn there that we are ought to speak boldly, but I love how he says I'm an ambassador in chains because Paul consistently calls himself a prisoner of Christ, a prisoner, an ambassador in chains to Jesus. And I love that, that he says that because truly we are ambassadors and in, in, in chains to Jesus. We're, we're a prisoner and a slave to Jesus. And we need to boldly proclaim the gospel, which he gives us, which does take so much boldness. It is such an offensive message, especially to our modern world. It's a very um, <laughs> politically incorrect message, but it takes so much boldness to proclaim. Like Paul here says, it's the way we ought to speak. Finally, Proverbs 28, one says, the wicked flee when no one pursue, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Uh, it takes a great shot at the wicked. The wicked don't even need anybody to be pursuing them in order to flee. But the righteous are bold as a lion. The lion such a beautiful, beautiful animal, so majestic in, uh, in walk and in mane. Uh, yesterday, I was watching the Chronicles of Narnia, and Aslan, who kind of portrays a Jesus-like figure, is a lion, and he's so bold and so brave and so fearless. And that's how we ought to be. We ought to be bold as a lion never backing down, never cowering. And um, before we do, and I'd just like to pray that you would have boldness. So if you would join me in prayer. Um, dear God, thank you for this message. Thank you that uh, you promise us that if we do meditate on your word and if we don't depart from it, that you will be with us. And you tell us that if, we're, if you're with us, that we should be very bold and very courageous, like you told Joshua. And so I pray that you please give us boldness like you gave Joshua and like you gave Paul and Jesus give us boldness like you have. And uh, thank you for this message. And I just pray um, that everybody watching you, please bless them and impart in them a spirit of boldness. And thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys. I'll see you soon.